know that we have been discussing about uh, communication skills every now and then any discussion comes up then uh, we told that we'll be covering that in the communication session to today there are two sessions so probably all of the answers will not be uh, or or the all of the questions will not be answered by today but probably we'll touch upon the basics today and uh, next session we'll be covering more into detail on digital communication and today we have dr paramthi uh, as our faculty and he is a professor of neurology and in charge of comprehensive epilepsy program in the department of neurology pgi chandigarh and uh, you you can see uh, he is a chairman of indian epilepsy association punjab ch chapter uh, he has a special interest in communication in healthcare and he was very actively involved uh, we had a series of lectures during covid uh, in, in palliative care in covid times and dr parampreet was a very active faculty during those covid sessions for probably a long time and we had so many participants from across the world for that program thank you dr parampreet for uh, giving us your time for this session and thank you so much thank you dr sri devi sri priya uh, yeah so we back with another session of communication so hello to all the participants uh, this would be a little different from the routine sessions which you having more academic based this is more a connection on a personal level and that is what we want uh, to do with all our patient and their caregivers also so we want to have this session in the same tone as we want to inculcate in ourselves when we talk to the patients and their caregivers let me just share my presentation okay yep so uh, as dr sri devi said i'm basically a neurologist so a lot of examples you may find in in between like maybe from neurology but their general communication is very general in fact it is not what we talk here is not even specific to medical knowledge and this communication is so very important in all the relationships we have whether it's in our professional personal domains house family spouse everywhere a good communication uh, you know covers a lot of deficiencies in sometimes our other uh, faculties so communication is very important in all things in today's talk however we'll be focusing on uh, the need of medical communication why do we talk about it barriers to effective communication and why doesn't it occur more routinely than we would want it to be and steps to uh, effective communication basically about listening skills rapport building paraphrasing our medical talk into into more comprehensible for the patients reframing issues and then communicating with empathy so there will be three things uh, what, i mean I, I, we could start with a bit of a feedback from you people and uh, i am told that many of you are experienced so that is good we'll probably have more active discussion so so you can just to start uh, you could jot down in the uh, in the chat box you, what do you think is the main benefit of good communication and uh, uh, i would also want inputs from do you think communication skill is a learnable skill or it comes naturally to us and the third is anything at the end if you feel not covered uh, although we have another session i believe uh, on the serious illness communication uh, we can do that time also but i'm happy to talk about anything we feel is needed and feel free to keep your co your comments coming in case you feel you need to do a v verbal comment just put your hand up and uh, i think our support team will have you put your mic on and we can go from there uh so i think there are some knowledges yeah it is a learnable skill uh and we get patients confidence that is very important uh you know especially these days where confidence levels are a bit low it's very important to have a clear communication to have the patient confidence level uh it does develop with practice so we have two opinions one that it is a uh, uh, learnable skill other is it uh, no it's actually same it develops with practice 
and improves compliance. That is important. Yeah, medical legal cases also. Many of them are actually seen to be purely because of communication back down rather than any incompetence or negligence. And uh, you get a proper history, very important. If patients are talking uh, uh, as Parul has said, and they'll give you a good history if you have built a rapport with them. Uh, so, yeah. So yeah, I mean, uh, there are benefits. I'll go through them uh, in a formal way also, but I guess all the points you all mentioned are very, very important. And uh, uh, as far as, as regards the second point, uh, yeah, it is. I think it's a mixture of both. It's, I mean, it's not written anywhere. It's my own feeling that sometimes, because before you get into formal communication, uh, uh, education, you feel that it is a natural skill. And I used to think like that, that, you know, people are born and there is a bit, some people do communicate well. I used to take epilepsy lectures at conferences and I thought that, what do I need to learn in communication? I mean, it is a naturally comes to me, but when I went into it, as you all have read, it is actually, actually a lot of it is learnable skill like any other science uh, we do. And we'll come to that. Yeah. Allays patient's anxiety. Thank you for all your inputs. So going to the, sorry. So I just made a little bit of a introductory, you know, acronyms, four C's of good communication, which I keep showing all the time. I don't know what's happening here. Yeah. So C, the first C is for candid. Basically, candid means honest. Um, I, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I, right now I won't be able to read the comments. I'll read them at some time if there's an important communication, uh, Sri Priya and uh, Dr. Sri Devi, if you could just point it out here. Yeah. Thanks. So you can stop me in between. So first C is candid uh, communication, mean, means honesty. So what we want to do here is we want to twist the style of uh, conveying the news or prognosis or general things to the patients, not the facts. So many times in our default and goodwill, what we want to do is give a very happy prognosis to the people. Oh, he'll be fine. Khada ho jayega, baat karega, uh, chalega. You know, all in good faith, but that is not what we want. We do not want to alter the facts to make the patient feel good. We want to put empathy in conveying the exact facts, what we know. The second C is clear. So it's in a language people understand. Again, as medical professionals, we have a lot of tendency to uh, talk in medical language. Oh, this patient has myocardial infarction. Why don't you do a lavage and all that? And this actually many times does uh, confuse patients and sometimes even makes them anxious. So we need to talk to them in the language they understand and not in the medical jargon. It should be concise. Uh, we need to avoid uh, information overload for the patients to understand us properly because it's a routine for us to talk about diseases. For them, they, they may be the first time they are in with a significant illness and their mind will be clogged. So we need to give the information crisply and in concise manner. And it has to be complete. Uh, many times we say things, but uh, we feel that everything is said and uh, that is actually in any communication breakdown, the biggest uh, faux pas is that we feel it has been said and we meant it, but the other person needs to be stated clearly. So it has to be complete. This is a video uh, you, I mean, it's from YouTube. It's about, uh, you know, it's uh, exercise people do in these groups uh, to build confidence in each other. And there's an instructor whose hand you see on one side and the green jacket is a new person joining the group. So to build confidence, what he's explaining is what he needs to do. So he tells him that he had to get on the stool and then people will gather around him. He closes his eyes and falls and people will catch him. So he has to put faith in the people so that they will catch him when he falls. So this is all being explained to him and then he's asked to fall and uh, they will catch you. That's what the instructor is saying. And then he falls. But unfortunately, as you see, he falls on the wrong side. So there's a last bit of piece was not told to him that which side you need to fall. You need to fall in the back. So see, 1% of missing communication can lead to errors. So more on the light side. But yeah, it is important. 
So as people did mention, actually there is more research on communication benefits of good communication and uh, uh, they actually show some medical benefits also. People have shown that higher empathy dealing, as we know, stress can lead to medical worsening of medical issues. So lower, uh, better control of diabetes, blood pressure, better pain scores, very, very important because a lot of pain can be psychologically enhanced in us. And if, we, if that's taken care of, our pain scores can be better. And someone already mentioned, patients will understand the treatment plan better if they are communicated well there is clarity there is understanding of adverse events they will report to us if there's anything wrong if we have explained it to them for my uh, you know my my practice of anti-epileptic drugs there is an uncommon side effect especially in our uh, country about drug rash with anti-epileptic drugs like carbamazepine and many times we forget to tell that to the patient and the patient ends up with a rash which can become serious in some patients and they don't know what is it due to their form of our place and uh, they just keep taking medication for it do not stop the medication so a small communication that any patients we try to make sure who started on carbamazepine has to be told very clearly in written or in uh, verbal that uh, you have to look out for this rash can happen so that 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 can improve medical out, uh, medical uh, outcomes also in these patients and patient will take responsibility because they are involved in the planning and there'll be more faith, which again, one of you wrote. So coming to the second part, do I need to look at the, yeah, I read your comments. Very right, what you say is what we're talking about. Uh, barriers to communication. So why, why do these barriers come then if we know all this thing? So there are many issues. Some can be doctor, medical, nursing, other can be patient issues. You know, patients may have generally a timid nature and, and in, in many societies um, and cultures, there may be a big power difference between uh, the patient and the doctor. So the patient is really looking up to doctors, not as a provider, but as a savior. And, you know, they keep saying in our culture, the Bhagwan ka rupa, you are like messengers of God. So that kind of, you know, difference uh, inhibits them being very frank and asking questions. It is changing. People are reading up sometimes too much on the net and coming. But by and large, you see the population, especially which is not educated, are very scared to ask questions. Then they say, oh, these doctors must be busy. Why I should not interrupt. They'll get angry. You know, my non-medical problem, they can't be bothered with all this. So many things are challenges which are in the patient's mind or, or their caregiver's mind. I, when I say patient, I mean both. And uh, again, uh, in uh, going on with this, the, there'll be fear, anxiety coming in a hospital, you know, a lot of illness patient around and uh, being worried about their own medical outcome uh, and there may be anger, there may be frustration, not necessarily at us, but at the situation which they have landed, they may be having a good life and suddenly they are in a chronic disease that can cause frustration. And, and when you are angered, frustrated, and then we talk in medical jargon, as I said, uh, it can all lead to cognitive clouding and sadness. So although we are not responsible for many of these things, we need to keep that in mind to make the patient at ease so that our communication can go through. So this is a clip uh, uh, I got on the net for uh, one of the movies I saw recently. And uh, uh, so, so there's a situation here which you can read and uh, hear is, is exactly what we are talking about. And probably one of the script writers or somebody has gone through that experience in the hospital. And they say exactly the way we are talking about uh, when you are in a hospital and talking to the medical professional. This, this, this caught my fancy and see how uh, this is from a uh, patient's perspective, how difficult it can be uh, in those situations. Now, uh, so many times what happens to end this part of the uh, talk is that uh, even be, be, with our best uh, of the 
efforts, you might have come to the conclusion when you explain to the patient very well properly, in the end, they would say, again, again, cultural, the doctor, you do what is best. Aap hi bata do kya karna hai. Which can be very difficult if you are trying to do the right thing by involving the patient into their decisions, but very time because we are sometimes not trained to take big decisions in our life. So in those situations, as uh, I've incorporated slide because a lot of people ask this question that this happens in the end. So what do we do? So we still can't impose our decision. But I, what I would do generally is that, uh, okay, uh, I mean, if I was, if you want, they say, Aap kya karoge? so if I was in your place, I may have chosen this because of this, this reasons. And if they agree to that, then again, take their consent for the same. So it's like holding a hand of the patient who is not ready to take a call. Uh, this slide is uh, because when we did this communication sessions and a lot of uh, questions were that ours is a very big hospital, like many of our hospitals are in the public sector and busy and a lot of patients, that we don't have time for good communication to happen. So, so it this this study showed uh, this uh, slide I've taken from the ACH is that. Uh, good communication actually many times saved time so it is counterintuitive right that why would it save time it will so they showed that people who were explained properly in the first go did not come back and waste uh, you know their own and our time you have you have seen people go out come back into your clinic or office that please tell me this please tell me this so they saw that overall if people practice good communication skills actually it saved time and the patient's time also I, I I can take a minute's break if any anyone wants to comment or or you can keep putting into the chat and um, just let me know if anybody wants to talk about what we've already talked or anything in that manner. Okay, so then you know as medical professional, a big thing from our side. This was like what is happening on the patient side. From our side, we have always been trained as medical professionals, as saviors, as I said, savior of lives, heroic deeds, you know, major surgery, cut out the thing, save the person. We, we are generally not trained to take defeat or, you know, we what we perceive as defeat or failure, even if it is not due to a lack of competence, but if the patient is sick or doesn't improve or dies, we don't know how to emotionally handle it. You know, we, we, we are scared that, you know, if what if the patient's family starts crying, they get angry. So this is where communication, especially communication of serious illness, which we're going to talk in the next session comes into play. Because we are also as medical professional, not adequately trained about these things. Somebody has written about the pediatric patient. We'll talk about it in the discussion. I am not a pediatrician. That is not my area. But by talking to pediatricians, I can give you some general views. But I would suggest that you read about that. We'll uh, remind me to talk about it at the end of the session. Some more examples that, you know, paying selective attention to what we call safe aspects. So if the patient asks us 10 things, I'm so worried, I can't sleep properly, I have pain. We just want to talk about the pain. Tell me about the pain. So we kind of cut out the softer, what we call soft skills or soft questions. And we never inquire beyond physical. How are you feeling? Like, how have you been coping? No. Uh, and sometimes we actually suggest you're getting better. You Are you okay? Are you getting better? We kind of put words into the people's mouth. So good communication entails that let them speak. Give a general, not a leading question, general question where they can talk themselves. That's what I was talking about already. Then there's the environment. So we don't realize, although they have, they can be, you know, limitation in the infrastructure, uh, as we all know that there's so many patients compared to the infrastructure available, 
but lack of privacy is a big barrier in busy clinics we've seen people you know 10 people inside a room and then you're talking to one and the others are listening and people cannot very openly talk about their intimate things in front of others mobile phones are a big distraction i mean i when when i talked about it i caught myself after that because you don't realize you're doing it unconsciously that in between some message comes and you're talking to the patient history and you pick it up and watch it for you it is just you know a moment's distraction but for the patient it gives a big impression that the doctor is not interested he's just looking at his book you know whatsapp or whatever which is coming so we need to keep these things in mind furniture can be a barrier if it's a huge table in front of you that can be very you know uh, again comes to power difference and may not happen so sorry uh, forget it so this is the if you sit near to the patient the communication can take place in a better manner Yeah, exactly. So uh, Manisha has written, sometimes a body language is more helpful and effective listening is important. This is what last slide was, the difficulty in showing that picture is not coming up, but that is what, yeah. So a body language being near to the patient, sometimes, you know, uh, wherever, wherever it is appropriate, putting a hand on their shoulder and giving them the confidence that uh, you are there for them. So all these, all these things do matter. Thank you for that comment. So I'll just briefly go in the next setup, the, what we call as communication skill sets one, two, and three, which basically is the uh, principles we want to follow. In a, Sometimes you may not be able to do everything. So that's why I highlighted a few things which may be more important. So skill set is setting up the meeting when the patient has come in. This is more relevant when you're talking about a little more serious chronic illness, then you would more want to go through these steps. Sometimes you may not need in all the patients. So in the settings which where it's needed, setting up the meeting means creating quick rapport. So greet the patient. Uh, there's no harm. If you, uh, what we like to do is if there's a card in front of me, I like to call the patient by name rather than just saying, bad jau, khade ho jau, udar a jau. If there is a name written on the card, I just take call them by their name. And uh, privacy, we already talked about. Um, then we need to set expectations uh, for time interruptions, as I talked about that, and minimize communication barriers. We, we already said these things. Then we elicit. This, this is important to know because sometimes a patient may talk about their more important thing. They also have their communication barriers. After after the third or fourth point, so we need to listen patiently and not just pick up the moment they say one thing, cut them out and start talking about it. So we it's good to let them make a list of the issues and then choose which is important mutually that this is what we are going to talk about. Of course, we may not be able to talk about everything. Uh, so we make an agenda for the next step. So the skill set two is now history building so there's a open this should be an open ended uh, request and we call as you call it attentive or reflective listening where is uninterrupted listening with looking in at the patient and making them feel that you are interested in them ask about the impact ideas expectations uh, every patient is different and we are usually trained to give a very standard treatment to everybody uh, a good communication entails uh, asking about patient's expectations and what are their values in life. And every patient may not want to have the most aggressive treatment. So that is a little delicate area we'll talk about in the next uh, session too. Empathy, of course, is unsaid and uh, important in every communication. And then uh, we talked about the clinical part or plan. So in plan, it is... Uh, the important thing to highlight is uh, these are all you know built up from our experience where the where the communication fallout happens so what i noted was uh, that many times uh, i uh, we used to write the patient that take this medicine medicine 3 months and come back uh, after 3 months now every patient didn't come back after 3 months they have their own problem they came after 5 months and they used to stop the medicine at three months because it was written three months in the card. So this made us, oh, we have to tell the patient that if you come after 
four months instead of three, continue the medicine till you come next time. So that is a, that was missing and that was what was causing a problem. So that is what it means. You tell them and then you ask them to teach back. So teach back is a thing where you ask the patient in the end, what did you understand? How long are you going to take the medicine? Whichever you feel is a critical area which the patient miss, ask them to talk it back to you. And then you'll be surprised that half of the time, even when you've talked clearly, they didn't catch it. And then we make the final plan. So uh, last part of this uh, module is, uh, what is the time? Okay. Uh, so last part of this module is, uh, uh, is about what we call these days in communication thing coming up is called shared decision making what you see at the bottom. So what we were used to doing as, as, as medical professionals, especially doctors were, that what we call as paternalistic, my way or highway kind of a thing. Okay, I have told you, you have to take this medication. And if you're not going to follow my advice, why did you come and waste my time? I mean, it's not uncommon for us to feel like that. And sometimes even say such things uh, to patients because we are we have been brought up or brought up in the sense in in a professional atmosphere that we just tell and the patient has to comply. Things are changing, as I said. People want to put in there, especially in many societies. Um, when you go and work outside your own culture, you see that people really want uh, information to be conveyed and they want to take a full decision. No, I don't want it right now. Tell me about it. What happens if I don't take it? How long can I postpone it? Sometimes you, if you're not used to these questions, you might get a little irritated. So we have to guard ourselves. Things are changing though. A lot of us are now doing what we call as informed medical decision making. So we tell, explain why the drug is required, why the medicine is required, how long it is required, why the surgery may be needed or not needed. And then we take an in informed decision with the patient. So by shared decision, we mean is we're going one step further than this. And the step is patient's values and preferences. So it's a little thing we all need to get here correctly is that how is it different from informed decision? So informed decision is good. Now the patient, as I come back to what I was saying, that you tell somebody that, you know, you need to take this chemotherapy. And uh, so what will happen? It will increase your lifespan from, you know, expected four months to six months. And what what will happen? And uh, it might be even longer. And otherwise, you know what's going to happen. And they say, no, I don't uh, want this. Uh, I don't want any more. You know, I may get vomiting or so. My values are that I don't want to have too much of done in my body. This is where again a barrier comes. So, are you? I mean, the natural thing is that let's say for a small thing like a patient who has cancer and you ask them to st st stop smoking and the patient comes back and he's taking all the advice but he or she has not stopped smoking again a tendency is this is patient preference is that i am 70 year old i've smoked all my life i'm not wanting to i could not give up smoking sometimes the reaction is then go go take treatment from some other doctor don't you know you're killing yourself you are technically, we are all are absolutely right in this. But what we are missing is that from the other patient's perspective, he says, I've lived my full life. I am addicted to this. I stop this happen. This happens. I understand, doctor, your advice is very good. And it is dangerous for me too, but I have not been able to stop smoking. This is where we need to come that, okay, I am there still for you. I will still treat you. You stopped your anti-epileptics when I told you not to stop. You had a seizure not saying that go to another doctor no okay happens we also miss antibiotics we doctors all miss a course of seven days we finish in three days and then we feel oh, we're okay so defaulting is in 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 human nature so this is where shared decision meeting that even when the patient is not following all the advice what we give we need to be there for the patient we need to do our best the patient had decided not to follow some of it and is not going well for that patient, so be it. So some do's and don'ts, which we all know, just going through this fast, that, you know, make eye contact is important. Uh, um, 
I have forgotten, uh, Dr. Sri Devi, Sri Priya, how long am I supposed to go on in this monologue? Uh, 330, you, 340. You can go up to 350. Sorry, I didn't hear that. Sorry, uh, there was a background noise there. So you can okay. go up to 350. That's uh, um, you, you have time. Okay. All right. So no, I'm not, I'm not, don't have much. I like more, having more discussion than this didactic thing. But yeah, let me just finish these slides and So making eye contact is very important. We don't want people staring. I mean, we all know these are human signs. I mean, it's, this happens in any relation or wherever you're making conversation. You know, uh, do not look away on a side and keep talking when you're talking to a patient and do not keep staring into the eyes. Somewhere in between is what we feel is ideal. Look at their eyes, then look away on the other part of the face and then look into the eyes. That is, the, that is supposed to be the most... Uh, you know, comfortable uh, way when two people are sitting opposite to each other and communicating. Many times we're wearing masks, especially with COVID times, we're always wearing big, big masks and PPEs and all that stuff. So, and people feel this is not required, the soft skills. But now think back and see. Uh, and next time note also, if somebody is smiling behind the mask, you can easily see that in their eyes. And even your voice tone gives away what, which which tone are you talking. So there's a lot of ways we can have a non-verbal communication even when we are covered from head to toe. This is just read this slide also. This is important, and uh, this is this is you know a lot of things I said are learnable. This is something I learned properly. This doesn't come naturally. Naturally is on the left side, which is actually on the don'ts, which we all used to say that don't get so worried over such a small problem. Isn't it natural for us to say? We want to build just the bachche ko bolte hai, vaisi patient ko bolte hai, ki do, what is it? It's a small thing. See, there's so many people around you who have bigger problems. We are all doing it in very good faith. But the communication experts say, and which I found true after we, I learned, is actually the other side should be done. That the fish, it doesn't make you feel, if somebody tells you, you are in pain, and somebody say, oh, your pain threshold is very low, you should have a better pain. So, no, that is not what we want to hear that time. Or if you know you made a mistake, let's get off from the medical knowledge. You made a mistake, or your child has made a mistake. We all know this. And we first time the, we meet the person, we start telling them, see, you could have done this. You could know that is not what they want to hear. That time, they just want comfort. They know that they are weak inside. That doesn't. We don't have to reinforce that. So look at the other side of the slide. And what is recommended is that normalize their behavior. Because if we were in this situation, we will probably be doing the same. So rather than wanting them to change or being critical of that behavior, what we need to say is that anybody in your position would perhaps feel this way. Once we learn saying that, we realize that that is a real thing. That, that's what I would want to hear, uh, that normalize my feelings of fear, anxiety, sometimes being obsessive uh, at home. And considering your, what you're going through, it's normal to feel this way. So this is the other side, which is what is called acknowledging and normalizing. That makes the patient or caregiver much more comfortable and your rapo, our rapo will be very good with them. And that is when they open up to us. All right. Oh, I actually finished my slides. Uh, maybe I went a little fast this time, thinking 3.30 is to finish. So I, I think I'll stop here because there usually are a lot of issues more to deal with the, uh, the second part, you know, communication of serious illness, but uh, <coughs> we, we can talk about anything or any other queries uh, we have. So this is the end of the talk. I like to acknowledge a lot of people who from here, from Palium, from uh, my collaborators in USA who have helped in these points and slides and discussions which we've had. Um, thank you to all of them. I think I'll end my uh, presentation, formal presentation here, and uh, people did talk about stuff and we can talk about, or if people want to think, 
then we can go over to the case. I'll, I'll leave it up to you. Uh, we can take up a few questions before the case presentation, probably. Sure. Uh, all the difficult any uh, situations of... Sorry. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, you were saying something. I was just saying... Uh, all the difficult conversations will be taken care of uh, during the next session, probably. Uh, how to communicate the bad news and how to deal with collusion. But uh, other than that, we can take up a few questions today before the case presentation. So regarding uh, my uh, one thing someone has asked about is pediatric patients. So their communication is, of course, a little different. And, uh, you know, their consents are also different depending upon their maturity or expected maturity or age-related issues or what is this? So it's a little gray sometimes area, but there are uh, the pediatric uh, pediatricians in communication talk about them. One is, of course, for extremely you know young kids, um, you have to talk to their caregiver or parents or whoever is the legitimate guardian of that patient uh, first. You can't talk directly to the patient, but beyond a certain age, you know, depending upon the setting, culture, hospital. Uh, people have found much value in actually talking to kids with serious illnesses in a graded manner or slowly talking to them. In, in our hospital, uh, sometimes beyond seven years, there is a, a assent form, which we call in consent with the parents and assent form from the kid. The child who can read and write uh, uh, gives an additional you know, consent uh, for uh, procedures or something in addition to what their parents know. So there, th this is a, for pediatrics, it is actually uh, goes a big spectrum for writing from obviously from infants, there's nothing to communicate to them. We have to talk to the parents from toddlers, then going to people in adolescence and then near adulthood almost, um, you know, a lot of the pediatric experts feel that you have to talk to them all about everything. If you feel they can uh, comprehend so there are things you can go and read up. I'm sure there's reading material available at what age kids become aware of death and dying and all those things. It again changes with society. So that is why, I mean, I don't have a clear cut pediatric thing, but the basic crux is yes, as far as possible, if the kid is uh, beyond a certain age or expected maturity, keeping them in the loop like any other person is, is quite useful in, uh, in in and not leaving them totally blank because just because they are children or they are 14 or 13 and not yet adults you want to add anything dr uh no not really actually i mean i don't have much experience with pediatric patients uh, as you said uh, but uh, i think uh, i've heard people uh, taking classes when they say anything any age about six uh, they do understand we should have the conversations about what is happening to their parents they may have a lot of questions many a times a lot of imaginations inside their head thinking that this can be a punishment for what i uh, i did some uh, mistake and then he scolded Absolutely. i didn't like it so that can be a part of uh, that my father is being punished for that so these kind of stories they have in their mind so it's very important to ask them what do they understand uh, about what is happening in in their home so uh, we do have uh, people talking specifically to children when there is an illness in the family to under make them understand what is happening it's not their fault generally they, they take it as their fault Absolutely. I think that is one point uh, which I didn't say, which you said is very critical that kids may have misunderstandings, you know, because of that attachment of uh, the, their parents or elders being their saviors and anything which goes wrong, they may take it upon themselves that, you know, somebody has punished, God has punished me or I've, I've been punished for this. So communicating that it is a natural thing which is happening may actually uh, make their mental state much better. So yeah, we do involve their parents and we from where they, they will come to know how their back, uh, you know, their backup knowledge is about these situations and then after taking them into confidence, do talk to them. Uh, there is another question. In rural setup where females don't uh, generally speak up, how to build a rapport with them? Yeah, so 
that is true i mean actually true for many situations as i said uh, more so in case of women more so maybe in case of rural state but even in urban areas some people are not built to talk so so the points which i said in the early part maybe skill set one is making them comfortable will go a long way in building rapport showing your genuine interest you know people are very very perceptive now teaching communication or showing this empathy may be something we all need to learn surprisingly what we don't lean, need to learn is uh, uh, assessing what the other person uh, uh, is meaning by their saying i hope i'm able to say it clearly that we may not be able to do all those things but if someone is playing mischievous or someone is playing genuine and someone is warm even animals understand that even small kids know which elder is uh, talking to them so if we are talking to them ingenuously with empathy understanding them giving them our focus looking at them not uh, uh, being distracted and in addition of course in special situations like you said we may need to provide safety to them if you feel that they are inhibited in presence of somebody you can ask them it's a patient's choice to have somebody inside or not the consultation chamber and if there is a you know mother in law or sister in law whatever if they have a inhibition from them you can ask them to step out i do ask many times in in young children i step uh, children in the sense who are young adults i ask their parents to step out if it's okay with the child so that they can talk to me clearly so privacy may be very very important in such a setup Uh, there is another question do you have any set of dialogues like how we should start in different situations which will help us to implement in our daily practice well a lot of it is actually improvise in the situation i mean if you uh, was this prakar ganesh if you want to what is that no who who asked this question sorry i think dr roshan roshan kumar. kumar yeah if you if you give an example it'll make it more interesting than i could say what i would say in that situation because many situations are different i may have different things to say in a serious illness i may want to start differently in a chronic illness um and, and so i have this um, where where we have a simulated that how how to talk to a patient who you have a I, I think I have that video in the next. Okay, yeah, that is in the serious illness. So mostly this comes up in the serious illness communication. A lot of controversies come that who to tell, where to tell, and how much to tell. So all I can say for today is that uh, uh, I like to know the patient's preferences well in time, so that that is how we talk. So that will come next lecture or next uh, session we have. but knowing where the patient's background and asking them few general questions which are not their medical history that what is their education status what kind of a society they're living in are they in a joint family are they in a you know nuclear family are they living all alone gives a, gives me a lot of thought that how should i approach to them what is the words to be said to these people but in addition to that if you have any specific thing in mind i'm happy to talk about it and i think uh, i just just to uh, add on to what uh, dr paramkrit was telling it's important to start the conversation as he was telling in the presentation that uh, introduce yourself where you are coming from what are you what are you going to do there which kind of team you belong to what kind of doctor you are so it's very important to start with that introducing yourself and one uh, rule that we follow in our setting is to sit uh, when you talk to patients we make sure that at least the person having or leading the conversation make sure that they sit so uh, in the inpatient unit as well as in a home care if the patient is lying down on the floor we sit on the floor and talk so maintain that i uh, level the moment you sit they understand that you are there to listen uh, you have some time even if you don't have time that gives the impression that you have time you are not standing and uh, talking to them so that is the moment generally when they start opening up and thinking that okay these are people who are there to whom i can open up a little bit more so the sitting is very very important as far as uh, my uh, experience is concerned like we are very particular that the person leading the conversation should sit uh, near the patient and talk 
No, absolutely. I totally agree with you that even the other point you made, sitting is one and introducing yourself is sometimes in a busy practice. We usually miss. We walk into the room of the patient, start asking them questions. They don't know. And sometimes I go and ask the patients that, uh, so I wasn't there. What happened? They don't know who came. Somebody came. Somebody said this. Somebody said that. So as Dr. Sridev is saying that if we, it is very, very important that we introduce either we have a name tag. A lot of times we don't. You know, many people don't wear aprons these days. So it is always when you're meeting the patient first few times, introduce ourselves and which is your position. Are you a medical professional? Are you administrator, doctor, nurse? Uh, whatever it is, they should know that tomorrow they can know who talked to them. And that makes them, you know, more comfortable too. There is another question Dr. Prakar is asking, is it acceptable to say that if uh, I was in your place, I would have done this? Isn't this a doctor-centric approach and leaving the physician open for blame in case of any failure in treatment? Yes, so that is that is that is uh, that is the last resort, as I said in the slide. Because you know what happens. I'm sure uh, uh, who all are practicing actively with patients know that, especially in our culture. As I said, I mean, there's a, I was working abroad also, and these things didn't come up. But here, I came back with all this that patient information, shared decision, and I would give a you know, 10 minutes discussion of the patient, pros, cons, this, that. And the end patient says, Doctor, I mean, aapko jo theek lagta hai kardo, whatever you feel is good for me. So that that is where you get stuck. And then you get a little upset that I have been talking to you about this. Why can't you take a call? But then you need to understand all of us are not built that way. Especially when we grow up our parent, in a society where you're told that you have to listen to the elders, not go against their advice. You know, your decision-making capacity is superseded by other people. And that is how in a joint family or in, in a patriarchal or that kind of families we grow up. And people are not ready to make a call, especially in this thing. So they will either go and ask their family and friends or they will ask you. So that is the last resort. What I meant was that if you are stuck, you can't go on like that. Patient keeps saying, jo aapne karna, you keep repeating that these are the options. No, no, you have to decide. No doctor tell me. No, no, you have to decide. So you will get stuck. So when I get stuck, what I do is that usually they ask, doctor, aapko kya lagta? Aap kya karte? so I, do, I will still not tell them that I think you should do this. But that will be definitely doctor-centric approach, not patient-centric. So that is why I use the word that, okay, if you want me to tell, maybe I may have chosen this one because of this, this reason, but you have to take your own call because every person is different. So this is just a way to break the deadlock. You know, you're stuck in a deadlock and no decision is being made. So it is just holding a hand and, you know, okay. And, and there would be, I'm sure. As, as a practitioner, even when you're practicing shared decision making, you'll have in your mind that which is better a little bit. And if the patient is actively asking you that what do you think is better, I think it's it's our duty to just give an idea and then still make them, you know, agree to that or you know, take them the make them the final decision. There is another question from Dr. Prakar about uh, the video recording of consent. Sometimes they become maybe withdrawn or suspicious. I think maybe they threatened, or they may feel threatened actually. Uh, so they do this in their setting to take consent in difficult cases for medical legal purposes. So how, how will you deal with that? Well, I haven't, I am honestly haven't uh, discussed or, uh, this situation before, but I'm just openly thinking when you we talk about this, uh, um, uh, when there is a in communication when there is a doubt in my mind i always like to fall back on the situation or the dictum that we go patient determines what is being done so if we have explained to them that it is for their benefit tomorrow that uh, or it is a requirement by a thing to make a video recording make them explain and understand properly i have a feeling that most of the people will uh, understand but if somebody is vehement about not doing it maybe i would document it there that patient has refused uh, consent for video recording they are not comfortable and that is why we are doing either audio recording or whatever is the rule actually rules are very different all over states and hospitals and where video recording is required and where only signature will do so maybe I'll just uh, discuss with the patient and if they're not comfortable, just uh, uh, 
uh, if if laws allowed allow me, I will just bypass it and note it down that patient is not comfortable. Dr. Sridevi, you may say anything. Uh, yeah, I don't have any experience in video recording consent. Actually, in our place, uh, I've heard, I've, I've started practicing palliative care, hearing Dr. Rajkobal telling that uh, the patients might be signing uh, the most important documents in their life, probably. So even when you take consent, we document the conversations, uh, but we don't ask them to sign on a consent that I am ready to, uh, et cetera, et cetera, and then sign because... Most of them will be signed, might, might have signed their will or some something really important. So when you ask them to sign on something, it is really threatening and that uh, uh, that breaks the rapport that we are going to build. So we, uh, if there is a difficult situation, we what we tend to do is like we document every conversation that we had with the patient. Uh, someone will be writing the whole conversation down with the page and the who were present in the, during that meeting. That's it. Uh, not up to the extent of uh, video recordings. But I totally agree to Dr. Parampiti. If they are uncomfortable, probably uh, we may have to uh, respect that uh, because they may be actually threatened. Even for the research purpose, when you do voice recording, people feel really threatened. They don't want to open up to you after an extent, right? Uh, they will talk to you freely without the recorder, but the moment you switch on the recorder, all their attention goes on to that recorder and they don't want to. So I think probably any kind of recording will uh, um, distract the patient from having an honest conversation. Uh, I understand there, there are certain situations that legally we may, you may need to do that, but um, we tend to avoid these kind of uh, uh, situations in our setting. Yeah, I mean, law, law allowing you, unless it's absolute in your hospital or something, the main crux should be about having a free conversation and giving them the right answers. And as Dr. Sridevi said, the, the, although requirement is there, but getting them to sign and all those things, we, we know, you know sometimes that if patient is not being explained and they're made to sign, this really doesn't hold up later because so our aim should be not defensive medicine, that is what we try, try to keep saying. Defensive medicine is when you overdo on the written part or recordings or, you know, overdo investigations. It's a very, very, you know, sticky area to talk about because uh, many professionals come up and say, oh, this is all required. So many medical legal cases are happening. How can you expect us not to do an MRI in this patient or not to do CT scan in a patient you expect it is migraine only? So... I can't say where to exactly draw the line, but our instinct would tell us that what is working best for the patient and what is okay for your minimum requirement also has to be fulfilled. But the focus, I, I still feel that if you have a good communication and rapport built up, many times those need for the other stuff doesn't arise. There I mean, is another interesting uh, discussion point from Dr. Uh, Pranjal. Uh, uh, will being too soft-spoken and polite to the patient and attendant make the physician prone to physical and mental assault in emergency situation? I, I think he's trying to ask, like, uh, where should be the balance between too soft-spoken or how much accommodative the physician should be? I think, yeah, <laughs> good question. I think we should be our natural self, empathetic. Once we are empathetic, it, it neither we have to, you know, be bullying the patient, not get bullied. Idea is to have an equal or equanimous or you know egalitarian, whatever you want to call it, relationship. That is what we want ultimately to happen. So uh, oh, I don't know what you mean by oversoft, but yeah, I mean, you don't have to uh, appear very shaky or incompetent also. We need to know, uh, that's what I say, say sometimes when you're talking about shared decision. The first thing is to know your facts. Come across as a person who knows your stuff only then the patient will be able to choose from them. If we are shaky among our stats, so once you're asking the patient to decide, we have to tell the knowledge very accurately. So this do, does come that we have to be, we should be confident in whatever to the best of our capacity and uh, not, uh, uh, but not threatening also. So it has to be, as Dr. Sridevi said, a bit of a balance in between uh, two way to, Assault is a different thing. We'll talk about it, I think, again in the next uh, uh, angry angry situation. We'll be talking in the next uh, session about angry situation, but that is becoming more and more uh, how to deal with the angry situation. I have a couple of slides which uh, on, on, on 12th, I guess, we have our next talk and then we talk about it.
and i i mean want to that i think uh, good communication is not not just being very soft spoken or too polite it's about uh, telling things very clearly in the language that they understand not to be like uh, creating an authoritative uh, tone uh, in what you are doing it's uh, you don't need to be too so soft spoken so when you take the doctors uh, who are all working in nar setting i think i'm not the softest a uh, speaking person but that doesn't mean that i'm a bad communicator you have to have a balance between you can't be too soft spoken all the time uh, you don't need to be uh, too polite also just that you should be able to communicate what you're supposed to communicate you should be able to understand the language and uh, the touch that you have to give at some times when they break down and just to be with them even if uh, they were they are just crying out they get angry how to deal with that situation i think it's uh, uh, um, sometimes patients get angry so you will be hearing about how to deal with that you can't just be sometimes you you can't be angry also you can't be too polite or shaky also all the time so uh, you don't need to be too soft you don't need to be harsh also it's like uh, if you talk to someone who know uh, we, we don't know the patient so we think uh, that you have to prepare and uh, learn these things if you are talking to someone who is known to you you may not prepare much right it just comes naturally i think over practice it, this communication skills just comes naturally you don't need to be prepared to be too soft or polite to have uh, these conversations with patients over a period of time absolutely i think it's quite intuitive i'll tell you a small funny story Uh, which happened when i few years back when i started getting this uh, taking this communication lesson in our institute our resident faculty and everyone and uh, i i i just went to the outpatient room of one of my residents and i found that she was being a little you know not very polite to the patient and uh, so um, once the patient was out i just gave her a call that uh, uh, let's talk and she came over and i said uh you know you know i've been doing this communication sessions and i think you were being a little uh, rough uh, with the patient she said she says you're right sir but ek baat batao i'll tell you something this patient doesn't go to anybody else i said why you know this patient last time when he came he 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 had not uh, taken care and i just gave him left right and center and now this patient refuses to go anywhere he says you are the only one who seems interested in me because you because you see this is a lot of our personal values connections we make or our culture the way we grown up in a family that sometimes you feel that somebody who's too polite or something is not interested in you and she felt the day i actually gave it to him he started following advice and you know this is very opposite to what we teach so you need to look at the situation and a little bit improvise what you want to do thank you thank you so much uh, dr paramprit for taking up all the questions i think maybe we can have the case discussion yeah. and then take up more discussion sure uh, dr vicky you can just unmute from your end and uh thank you uh, am i audible yes perfect okay uh, good afternoon everyone uh, my name is dr vicky bakshi i am an assistant professor in respiratory medicine in uh, shrinagar uh, uttarakhand so uh, i will be talking about the case where a uh, 65 year old female uh, she was diagnosed with bronchogenic carcinoma with the right sided malignant dual Yeah, that means her staging was stage four uh, A. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, presenting complaints: she uh, came with uh, loss of appetite for eight months, loss of weight for six months, tough with expectoration for three months, shortness of breath for one month. Next, the patient developed cough with expectoration from three months back when she went to a central government institute that diagnosed her as a case of squamous cell carcinoma of lung with malignant fluid effusion. patient left uh, against medical advice that is she took lama from that institute and went home now she presented to us with chief complaints of cough with expectoration for 3 months and shortness of breath from one month the breathlessness was gradually in onset and progressive in nature so modified british uh, medical research council grade was 
that is she was having a dyspnea test also examination patient was conscious and cooperative well oriented time place person thin built and poorly nourished her vitals were stable uh, except for uh, o2 sat her saturation was 90% at room air uh, pallor ictus cyanosis was absent digit digital clubbing was present grade 3 that is she was having drumstick appearance of the nails and lymphadenopathy was absent on chest examination uh, the examination was consistent with uh, right sided uh, uh, pleural effusion and systemic examination was within normal limit next okay. chest x ray uh, showed homogeneous opacity on the right side with the right uh, posterophenic angle ob uh, obliteration that is uh, chest x ray was also suggestive of uh, uh, pleural effusion on the right side routine investigations were within normal limit so uh, here what we did we did icd insertion uh, under local anesthesia and fifth intercostal space and on the first day 1.5 liter of zero sanguinous pleural fluid was drained on the next day again 1.5 liter was drained and then on the third day we drained 1 liter so as to avoid reperfusion pulmonary edema and patient's general condition had uh, slightly improved so psychosocial aspect she was a 65 year old woman living in her own house in the hilly areas of uttarakhand with her daughter in law uh, her grandson and granddaughter and her son uh, was serving in the indian army in the northeastern border her daughter was married and living in new delhi uh, with her husband and two children so main source of income comes from her son her husband died two years back due to myocardial infarction she was confused regarding her situation as she was never told about her diagnosis so basically what happened was that uh, from the central institute from which they came uh, her bystanders were knowing about her situation but she was confused as to what was happening to her and uh, her son daughter in law even grandchildren knew uh, the diagnosis and poor prognosis of the patient but they didn't share it with her they even insisted that even i should not share this knowledge with her as she will be devastated by the news due to her recent loss so medications uh, she was on symptomatic management at that time uh, moisture to inhalation via nasal prongs so that her spo2 remains 92 to 96% uh, ceftriaxone injection uh, uh, injection pantoprazole diclofenac and uh, icdk so the main concern was explaining the poor prognosis to the patient explaining the poor prognosis to the patient and communication with the relatives or bystanders regarding it so summary a six, this uh, was a 65 year old woman having bronchogenic carcinoma with right sided pleural effusion not knowing a diagnosis and prognosis of a terminal illness so discussion points are should the diagnosis and prognosis be explained to the patient uh, as the bystanders are saying not, not to explain it to the patient if yes then how to counsel the relatives on disclosing the facts to the patient and how to explain the patient about a terminal illness what consideration should be taken while doing so thank you thank you dr vicky uh, i know that many of these questions are covered actually in the next session but most of the presentations that we received have a uh, similar scenario because i think all of us invariably go through this difficulty like how to tell and uh, to whom to tell all these confusions so uh, most of the situations were sent to us with the same thing so i thought i will we'll focus on i um, mean how to start this conversation and how to uh uh build up the rapport with the relatives and patients for today's session and probably how to disclose and whom to disclose will be covered uh, uh in the next uh, session <laughs> thank you thank you dr ruki and i'd like to uh wait for the chats to come up like how to uh we are not uh, taking the questions on uh, whether to disclose or not probably today uh but uh, how to go ahead with having the conversation with the patient and the family members yeah let's have a uh, as you said dr sridevi let's have people write what they would like to do you know why i mean there's no right or wrong in this i'll tell you more, more next time but uh, in short we'll go with the technicalities you know there is a now a scientific protocol spikes protocol and all that we'll go over next time but in short uh, dr wiki nice case and this is one of the you know most difficult and we we um, i mean we do expect this is uh, most of the cases as dr sri devi comes up to this because this is where a lot of experts in communication also differ 
and I'll, t I'll tell you the reason why. One is the rightest thing to do. One is what is practical in the thing. So let's have people uh, either, you know, if you need to unmute, just unmute your uh, mic and talk about it and or write your comments. I'll just start the discussion by uh, answering the first question, which is easy. That should the diagnosis prognosis be explained to the patient? The legal and the ethical answer is yes, both is yes. Uh, you may all know that there is a, you know, a charter being drafted by the government or probably it has been drafted where it has been incorporated that not telling people uh, may not go in favor with us and the requirements we have as medical professionals. There are many reasons to that. I'll come to the you know gray areas later, but technically, if we don't tell people, we don't know that uh, you know what is the family situation mostly it is okay sometimes uh, there may be skirmishes brother to brother sister to brother father to son and the best interest of the patient may not always be served by only limiting the discussion with the family so yes we have to make all the efforts to tell the patient about the they may be wanting to plan something they may have to write their will there may be somebody who's not interested in them uh, knowing that they will alter their will or something. You realize the complications of not patient knowing they want to marry off some people. They want to tell some money which has been, they want, they have a property for the children lying somewhere which nobody knows. They just want to gift it at the last moment and that is gone if they don't know. So a lot of complications can occur if we don't explain. Yes, there'll be barriers which we will talk about uh, later, but we are required to make our best effort and the last line here will say today is that what I like to do is to somehow bypass or, you know, uh, uh, you can say avoid getting into the situation is whenever the patient comes first time, not always possible. When the patient comes first time, when I even I don't know the nerve conduction report or EMG report, whether it's a motor neuron incurable disease or it's a normal neuropathy, or in other cases, in your case, lung cancer, or you don't have the biopsy report, it could be just pleural effusion. That is the time to ask the patient that we are going to do some test on you. Who would you want to talk about it? Whatever the result comes, I just want to know it. I don't know what is it. It will be something minor, maybe a little more significant. When we get the report, who is the person? Would you want to know everything? Would, would you want to talk? And would you or, or nominate somebody? So we go by the patient's will. If the patient says, many times old people, ladies, and say, oh, my son is there, you talk to him. Then you're perfectly fine talking to them and not telling the prognosis. And that is because the patient has actively given consent that they'll tell me what they want to. They know best for me. Many times people say, and we all have experience, and it is increasing. I will show some research in the next session where they said a huge majority wanted to know. It's more of an emotional thing that uh, they will not be able to tolerate. Don't tell them. They will uh, they'll be... In, it, it may be partly true, people may get, but still uh, the, in that research paper, which I showed, a lot of people wanted to know. So it may be a miscalculation on our part, thinking that our loved ones will not want to know. So the default position is yes, of course, there'll be situations when you haven't even met the patient, only the relative is coming to you with the report and talking. Then you, all you can do is encourage them and tell them the values of talking to the patient and get the patient and make every try that when they get the patient, you tell them that I'm talking to your child, right? And they know if they want to know, they'll ask, tell me what you're talking to him, right? So there are many ways to go softly over this very, very particular situation, more in our Eastern culture. I think I saw a movie one of the whether it was a korean or chinese movie similar uh, probably things happen in that culture it's called the farewell where the grandmother exactly your patient is not told in the i mean i won't tell the end so it, it the the good and bad points a very nicely made movie and many others are made like that so that is all i want to say right now but we we will talk about this before i think there's a lot of points uh, have you read Dr. Sridevi people's comments? You know? Yeah, Dr. Manisha is telling that we should talk to the family members and talk to them and tell them the benefits of disclosing the diagnosis to her. Uh, similar line, um, uh, I think, although the patient should be explained, but eliminating the caregivers will lead them to distrust us. Yeah, 
exactly they may not directly want to bring the patient next time to you because you did not agree with them probably so they may want to take her to another doctor who may not be telling her at all so dr parul is telling that um, speak with patients relatives first and ask why they fear the most and explain then accordingly with cons of not telling and uh, we should tell the truth uh, but in front of their close relatives uh, dr andrew has raised his hand yes dr andrew please unmute Am I audible? Yes, Hello. yes, doctor. Okay. Uh, I think this is the beautiful part about the eating. Okay. Uh, I think there is uh, some disturbance in the background. So your voice is not very clear. No. Yeah. Now it is clear. Please. Okay. I think this is the uh, the point of palliative medicine as well as community medicine. In my opinion. Uh, Yes, uh, medical knowledge as well as other uh, fields, sub sub fields, specialties, super specialties is always there. But this is one of the areas in which um, medical knowledge uh, intersects with legal and um, well, uh, medical legal cases. So uh, I would split this in two or three places. For example, number one, what if we don't tell them and they come back to us and tell us why we did not tell them? Number two, if we did tell them. Would it help the uh, prognosis or diagnosis? Number three, it is the right of the patient. Number four, we have to respect the right of the patient as well as the family members. So I think it is, um, a, yes, I agree it's a gray area, but also at the same time, uh, we have to know who is in charge here. And the person who is in charge, in my opinion, is still the patient. If the patient asks, it is our responsibility to tell. So, uh, the, um, the, of course, I can argue 10 other points in the other way but i still think that the uh, right of the patient has primacy in this uh, kind of similar situation i mean uh, that's my take um, it's totally up to you but, uh... i totally agree with you dr andrew and a lot of stuff what you said i'll just add that thing which i repeat to that so uh, even though a lot of people have written about the family and, and that is coming from, you know, as shared families, joint families, somebody's, you know, old person is, doesn't have the money, the son is financing or daughter is financing the the expenses. So a family involvement in our culture is different. So we, we may not be able to practice everything which is practice anywhere else in the world. So what I was going to say was that it is the patient's right to know the diagnosis. It's also the patient's right to not know. So in my case, I would want more emphasis on asking the patient what they would like to be done, whether they'll be the people. And if they clearly say, tell me everything, then whatever the patient's family says, we have to tell them we are obliged. But if the patient is gray, okay, you can talk to my son. They have faith in their children. And then, I mean, they'll tell me, then, then I'm okay. So for me, the sacrosanct thing is knowing what the patient wants, whether they want to know or equally important if they don't want to know. They, I do get patients where they don't want to know. They're especially the elderly people who are not educated. They think their children are very smart and intelligent and they are they know what's happening today. They will say, no, no, talk to my son, talk to them. They'll, they'll tell me, then I'm okay. But you are absolutely right. If it, if it is not there, that consent is not there and the patient is actually wanting to know, then I don't think we are right in withholding information from them. So there is another uh, point um, uh, Dr. Roshan is bringing up. Uh, as far as cancer diagnosis is concerned, most of the patients anyways know just because they are coming to cancer center daily, but maybe the caregivers or patients don't reveal or discuss uh, the same to each other freely. Absolutely. They mutually know both of the family. This is actually more common than uh, not that the patient knows, the family knows, but they don't like to talk about it. That is fine with me. If they don't want to talk about it and the patient wants, that is their prerogative. How much openly they want to talk about death and dying is not commonly talked about in our culture again. So that's why these things cannot be black and white uh, because they're hugely in communication, there are cultural issues take a lot of uh, part in that. And, and uh, you know, we've grown up where we were told if you're talking about death, oh, don't talk about death. It's not a good omen to talk about death. And here we are talking about that to talk about death. It's so clearly that, you know, what is gonna happen? How many weeks you're going to live? So you see the dichotomy here. 
So we will face cases both ways where people would want to know who are clued up and who are individualistic. Society is changing more towards individualistic. Nuclear families are becoming, you are more involved in yourself and your finances rather than a whole 10 people being careful. So, but we have both type of uh, uh, family fabrics available. And that is why we need to be a little malleable in, in, in these things. But of course, keeping our absolute right of, if we are asked clearly by the patient, no way we can refuse telling them. Yeah. Any, any other comments or sharing? Uh, I think I... Uh, uh, yes, Dr. Paramprit, you have inspired Dr. Mish to watch movies uh, with a good observation. Yeah, yeah. A movies is uh, one of my favorite pastimes. So uh, after the work, uh, I like I mean, a lot of my life philosophy comes up from music, music lyrics and from movies. So I do keep quoting them quite a bit, uh, even in my medical talks. Uh, so yeah, it's always good to read or watch movies. I like that. Good. You can watch some good movies. Ask me, I'll send you a list. But going up to the questions, I think there were the, there a lot of good points, which actually a lot of points we are going to discuss in the next session that, uh, you know, give it in small chunks. Uh, Sumita has written that uh, they'll be confused and asking them in between teach back, as I said. So that is very good point. Again, emotional support of the family is important. I agree with you. I agree with you totally. If you have to take the family along and uh, the as Dr. Vicky's question was that day, but if you one day you have to choose between the family and the patient, the patient comes first, no doubt about that. Speak the patient's relatives first and ask, yeah, that's okay. We, we, we would want to involve as much as possible within the framework of our rules and regulations and legalities. We would like to involve the family as much because they are the emotional carers. They'll be meeting us for a short time. The family is a huge caregiver, especially in our society. You know, there's so much of bonding. So I, I totally agree with the points you made. Only thing is we need to find a way to do things best and keep it, walk the thin line actually. Uh, maybe Dr. Paranthrit, as a neurologist, I understand you deal with patients uh, with difficult communication, probably, who may not be able to communicate in the way that we expect them to. So would you like to tell something about the patients who may not be able to talk or communicate properly? Yeah. Cognitive so, issues. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, so that is what comes under the heading of competence of uh, uh, communication. So sometimes, especially in our neurology, as Dr. Sri Devi said, the patient may not be competent to communicate. Competent means whether due to an intellectual uh, disability or a physical disability or an aphasia or maybe a stroke which has happened which they can't hear. So those, those, those things uh, may make it more challenging to communicate. And, and uh, uh, so while making difficult, difficult decisions and uh, uh, taking consent, there is a sub part of what we call is, is the patient competent to take the call or not? Whether the patient can understand. So as a doctor, as a neurologist, or whichever way, we need, if the patient is demented, patient has dementia, of course, we are not going to discuss with the patient, even if uh, the patient uh, has, or any kind of thing which is clouding their judgment, if that is established, then uh, depends upon who's the next of the kin and or there is a legal heir, or, or many times in... Um, Western countries, uh, they, there are court appointed people who take over if there is nobody else there. So these are more of logistic matters, but I totally understand there'll be a lot of people who have, is that what you meant, Dr. Sridevi? Those who are not able to physically communicate? Yeah. Yes, yes. So those challenges do remain and they have to be seen case to case. If somebody can't hear, we we can write and show them because in, you know, the strokes and all, they can just have a pure apraxia or aphasia or they can't speak and they, we ask them. So if there are that kind of limitations, we need to work around another movie and book I would talk about. That is, a, there is a famous editor of a magazine who had in our neurology, what we call is locked in syndrome, a brainstem stroke. Where, where the whole body is paralyzed, the patient is fully conscious. 
I mean, I actually had a patient like that a couple of weeks back, young person with a stroke in the brainstem, and all they can do is move their, blink their eyes and move their eyes up and down, not even sideways. It's in the pons, the stroke, and then nothing below that. And this person had it, and then they learned new ways to communicate. And in the end, uh, uh, the, along with the trainer, he ended up writing the book uh, called Diving Bell and the Butterfly about the experiences. And that is, uh, so I'm just talking about, we need to work around and try them as best as possible to communicate with them. Thank you so much, because uh, these are a group of patients where we all struggle to have a proper communication because of a lot of impairment or uh, uh, cognitive issues and we may struggle to understand what actually they want and we may have to depend on the proxy most of the times and we don't know whether that is what actually the patient wants and taking decisions uh, in terms of continuing treatment not uh, or assessing pain uh, is, so absolutely uh, I, I just want to do assessing pain is uh, you know that is and again in in the many, many situations i uh, just repeating not only locked in many strokes especially coming back to neurology people do feel because they're not communicating they're they're unconscious or they're not listening but many times in, as you know in aphasia motor aphasia which is very common in strokes we encourage people to keep talking to them even if they're not responding there may be some sort of a receptive in the uh, area in the brain which is functioning so keep talking to people that may actually help them you know have the will to live and maybe recover better but it is challenging i agree with you totally Thank you so much. Are, are there any other questions that I've missed in the chat or you want to unmute and yeah. ask? Um, questions or points, you can unmute and talk, yeah. Sir, please share your mail ID uh, for getting a list of movie related to palliative care and uh, communication. <laughs> okay, I'll just write down uh, in the comment section my mail ID. Uh, just for, to let you know that why I'm asking is, uh, as per the NMC new guideline, there is something known as ATCOM has been started for the UG students in medical college. So uh, we are using sometimes movie clips uh, to teach them attitude communications. And that's why we would love to have a list from you, sir. Yeah, yeah you know, I do. I'll do. If you write to me, I'll get back with the, whatever recommendations I have. I'm aware of that. So, so I'm aware that now it's a good thing, good change that the the undergraduate medical students are being uh, in many places. I think even the NMC has come up with some communication areas which are being taught. We don't have a medical college yet in PGI, so I'm not sure about the curriculum. But the, but but there's a big gap between people who passed out and who are in first year now and the rest of us practicing doctors. So that is why we need to do this communicate. Once, once it becomes a routine, we are trying to incorporate into our postgraduate training as a routine and some sort of evaluation also. We are working on all these modules and if it is, works out, we'll share it with other people also so that is what i'm currently working on and uh, so this is an email if you want you can write to me somebody i'm just saying there was a point about listening active listening which is uh, somebody has written listening is very important i think dr sri devi was responding to that and uh, and i remember listening to a discourse from the, you know this rajneesh osho rajneesh was happening and it stuck into my mind what what he was saying that that when we are talking most of the time in a dialogue either we are talking or we are waiting for the other person to stop so that we can make our point you know it's a very simple thing but it stuck with me and i realized in my further communication that it actually so much happens you are not listening to the other person you are talking what you want to say you want to say your point so much that when somebody starts talking you are just waiting for them to stop and you want to give your point again missing out whatever they are saying or even sometimes cut in you if you you're getting too restless we cut in too much into other people's conversation so yes absolutely in any communication medical or non-medical active listening or you know what we call and uh, that is that is very very generous listening is very very important yeah dr raj Gubal has made sign boards everywhere in the inpatient units just to remind ourselves that you have to listen then yeah. you talk so everywhere there is small boards of listen that's one thing that he insists a lot and dr parampri this is a group of uh, doctors all of them are from medical college they are all medical college faculty and this training is specifically for them so that 
uh, they are uh, people who we are looking forward to to teach medical students all these modules. So this is a, a smaller part of a bigger dream uh, of uh, reaching into the MBBS uh, curriculum. So uh, these are all people uh, working in medical colleges. So they yeah, are yeah. going to uh, take this forward. Uh, yes, Ripya told me that is very heartening. Doing all these sessions, but. Uh, uh, there are a few more topics that we'll be incorporating according to the new NMC guidelines. Great. You yeah, know, that is very, very important that people go and teach. That is what we do. Like we have a session for the new residents. And, you know, in PGI, we have one new resident batch means around 300 or more residents in every six months. And uh, we do them, but that is not adequate. We need to, so what we want is, that first, we, when we started, we called two, two representatives from every department to come so that it is a hub and spokes kind of a thing that everybody takes it forward to their small groups because communication, this one didactic thing won't happen. So it's very good that we have people who will be like, we are talking to the teachers who are going to go and teach uh, this forward. And now that, uh, you know, you have my mail, you can write to me and we can communicate if more is required in any manner. And um, I'm not aware about the MBBS curriculum, but if there is anything uh, you want to talk about, uh, I'm happy to, uh, you know, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Parampreet. And uh, along with the list of videos that we'll be sharing, for each session, for the second phase of uh, this program, you'll be getting all the small video links where to use, how to use, along with the trainer's guide, all the PowerPoint presentations and uh, short video lectures that you can use. So you'll be given all those uh, training dockets uh, with you uh, during the second phase. Whatever you have heard, all the resources along with the lectures and links and the guide will be given to you, all of you. Thank you so much, all the participants, for a wonderful interaction through the chat because uh, we have a lot of discussion uh, than as Dr. Parampreet wanted uh, more discussion than the monologue, but it, it went that way. There were more discussions. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Parampreet, for an interesting session once again with us and uh, for your time uh, during your duty hours. Uh, thank you so much, all the participants, for being with us. Thank Stay you. Ready? Thank you. It was wonderful communication. Yeah, so thank you all the participants also to communicate and talk. Bye. Thank you, Dr. Parampreet. Uh, so I believe that as I promised in the start of the session, this indeed became very informative and interactive. So please uh, stay tuned with us for the next part of this uh, session, Communication 2 on 12th after a short break of two days, uh, tomorrow and after tomorrow. So on uh, Monday 12th, again, we'll be meeting Dr. Parampreet with the second part, which is going to be equally important and interesting as well. So with that note, uh, this is Sri Priya, along with Dr. Parampreet and Dr. Sri Devi Varya signing off from the Tips Eco Hub. See you in the next session. Till then, everyone, take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.